morning, everybody. Today's, uh, today's reading is taken from Luke 22, uh, 1 to 23. Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, called the Passover, was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus. For they were afraid of the people. And then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. And so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question amongst themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Um, and Pete, thank you for, uh, pray, for reading. He can do readings. He can hang curtain rails. There's no end, really, to the talent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know uh, about you, but I find it really hard at the moment to watch the news. There's not a bit of good news there. You know, Gaza's being decimated, Beirut bombarded, Israel bombed. War feels real at the moment. And there's this fear, oh, what could happen next? If things aren't dealt with well, what will be the next step? One of the courses I've done as part of my MA was Themes in Moral Theology. And when I came to writing the essay, um, I chose to write about war. It was when Russia were beginning their attack on Ukraine and I was watching the news endlessly and with CNN on in the background I wrote an essay on whether there's such a thing as just war or not and the conclusion I came to was no I don't believe any war is just war is not about equals it's about one being stronger, one being weaker. There is always death. The trauma of war lives on in lives who have witnessed its horror and have felt the thud of the bombs. And even the land holds the trauma of war. War will be over one day, we hope. And then there will be so much rebuilding. 
war is unjust. The suffering it brings is beyond comprehension. And today we stop and remember the times our world has been at war. We remember the casualties who have been irrevocably changed and the deaths that have mounted up. And you'd think we'd have learned our lessons, but we haven't. So remembrance is as important today as it ever was. And as we remember the years of war this world has endured, the effect it has left on those countries who were bombarded, we realize how dark these times were and are and we ask God to shine his light. Now the question asked by many is, if there is a God, why do wars happen? Now if we're really honest, as Christians, we don't always like these questions because we wonder too. We see human distress and our hearts are affected and we wonder, where is God in the midst of all this suffering? This is why I chose the Last Supper as a reading for today. Because this meal is monumental. The followers of Jesus, they have no idea how significant these moments are, but Jesus does. They sit down for Passover a meal that they had done for years and a meal that had been happening for generations before this moment. And Jesus comes and he takes bread and he takes wine from the table and gives the meaning a new twist, which will help his followers to hold on to the memory of his presence when their world gets dark and he's not there and they're filled with trauma and distress. Even as the room and the meal are being prepared, there is a stench of evil because Judas promises to hand Jesus over to the religious leaders so they can kill him. In the meal, the disciples are all jostling for position. I want to be favorite. No, 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 I want to be favorite. I want to be the one that's closest to Jesus. And Jesus sees what's going on. He knows what's happening. And he sees beyond this meal and beyond the, the, the jostling for position. He sees the cross ahead of him. He knows that before the day is out, there will be suffering and pain. There will be death and it will be horrible. The religious, religious leaders will show no remorse. To Jesus, no compassion will be shown. All of hell will break out to silence the one who spoke truth, the one who is truth. So Jesus takes his place at the table. He says, I've really been looking forward to sharing this meal with you before I suffer. He has longed for this place, this table, these moments that will mark the beginning of his suffering. I'm not going to eat again until we all eat together in the kingdom of God, he said. Everything is about to change. But although he will die, the day will come when they will be united in Father's presence, in God's kingdom. And God comes to rule with peace. Jesus breaks bread. He says, this is my body given for you. Do this. Break bread and remember me. And then the wine, the cup that is poured out as a symbol of the new covenant in my blood. He's saying a new day is coming. A new day ruled not by law, but by grace and welcome and acceptance. 
body broken, blood poured out. Remember me. It's interesting, don't you think? That Jesus wanted the disciples, those closest to him, to hold on to and remember the moments of brokenness. The moments when his body was broken and his blood poured out. At this point, he didn't say to his disciples, the next 24 hours are going to be pretty rough, but hold on till Sunday because I'm coming back. He didn't say to them, you're in for a bumpy ride, but don't worry. I'll see you again in a couple of days. He could have, but he didn't. Jesus says, remember the brokenness, remember the suffering, remember the trauma and the horror and the cross. And when he cried, it is finished from the cross, I think he spoke for everybody because that was him ended. I think everything Jesus did was intentional. He knew what he was saying. He knew what he was doing. And I think he wanted those who suffered, and we all suffer, so he wanted us to know that he understands suffering in a way no one else does. He understands trauma because he was traumatized. He understands being out of control because the world around you works against you. He understands the unfairness and the injustice of war because his death was brought about by unfair trials and lies and deception. Now in Christian circles, we know how easy it is to jump from Good Friday, to jump from the cross, to the resurrection, even before Good Friday's at an end, we're wishing everybody happy Easter because we want to move past the pain and the death. We want to celebrate the life. But I want to suggest that Jesus wants us to linger with his pain. Why else would he leave symbols of his broken body? And his blood poured out. Why else would he make the request for remembrance in a meal rooted in, in betrayal and disappointment that ended with crucifixion? Perhaps it's because more often than not, the experience of the world is pain and heartache. And he wants us to know that he is with us in the darkness, shining his light. We know from the stories we've heard, from the books we've read and the history we've been taught, war is dark and difficult. Lives are expendable so that the victor can be victorious. Regardless of what side you fight for, your journey home is not guaranteed. Where is God when the suffering is that intense? This last supper, the cross, the brutality of the death, it shows us when it gets that intense. Jesus suffers with us in the midst of the darkness. He is with us at our darkest moment, not as our companion, remote and detached from our pain, but as one who understands. He gets it. And in the darkness, he's given us bread, he's given us juice to drink, and he says, remember me. 
And of course, as Christians, we hold on to the wonderful hope. Death is never the end. Because of the resurrection, we hold on to the truth of light shining into darkness, of hope replacing despair, and life emerging from the place of death. However, we may just need to stay in the pain for a little longer. I wish war would end and peace would come. It doesn't always. So in the darkness, I invite you to hold on to the one who knows all things. The one who wants us to journey with him until peace is a reality in our world and peace is a reality in our hearts and in our minds. Remember me, Jesus said, in the chaos and the darkness. Hold my body broken for you. Hold on to my blood poured out for you. And allow yourself to be caught up in the Godhead. Life for now and life forever. Where is God? Then it all goes dark. And he's with us, helping, understanding, experiencing with us. When we hold this reading and all that follows, if we hold that as truth, becomes a signpost for us to engage with God, even when our world falls apart. Jesus didn't make it difficult. He knew we couldn't cope with difficult. So he picked up bread. He said, remember me. Today we remember those whose lives have been taken. Remember those whose lives have been changed. Remembering is important. May we never forget. Let us pray. Today, Lord, we have remembered your body broken and your blood shed so that we could find hope in our despair light in our darkness, and life when there is death. We thank you, Jesus, that you don't just draw alongside us with a pat on the back, but you get involved in all that we're experiencing in our lives. The good bits and the not-so-good bits. The bits that we're happy to share and the bits that we hide away. for the joys and for the sorrows. Jesus, we thank you that you're part of it all. You know what we're experiencing today. You know how we've turned up to church and what kind of week we've had. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God who wants to speak to our hearts today. So Holy Spirit, in the moments we have left and in the week that lies ahead, if there are things that we need to ponder on because of today. Help us to be aware of them. May we not forget, even when remembering is hard. Jesus, we bring all of our prayers into your name. Amen. Amen. Thank uh-huh.